Good evening, and thank you for attending this public lecture sponsored by UC Santa Barbara and with the generous support of the John Templeton Foundation. This talk is part of a multi-year program at UCSB titled New Visions of Nature, Science, and Religion. Further information is available from our website, www.newvisions.ucsb.edu. There is an email announcement list you may subscribe to from the website. My name is Jim Proctor. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography, which is co-sponsoring this evening's event along with UCSB's Medieval Studies program. Our distinguished guest is Hans Tyson, a core participant in our New Visions program and a professor of ancient and medieval philosophy at Radboud University, Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Being a good geographer, I looked up Nijmegen, which happens to be located right next to Germany, but is also celebrating its, get this, 2,000th anniversary this year. Quite an appropriate place, therefore, for our guest to do his pathbreaking work in historical philosophy. I will soon welcome to the podium UCSB Professor of History and Environmental Studies, Michael Osborne. He will give a fuller introduction of our special guest. Following the lecture, we will have a question and answer session. Then we invite you to meet Hans afterward in a special reception to be held right here. But first, since I have a captive audience, a quick background on the New Visions program. The focus of our program, as suggested in the brain Earth image is concepts or visions of nature, by which we include both biophysical nature and, more germane to tonight's lecture, human nature. Questions about the nature of biophysical and human nature have been central to scientific and religious traditions, and the diverse answers they've provided have resulted in both conflict and consensus, ranging from recent differences over human stem cell research to a joint agreement signed by scientists and religious leaders declaring their common support for environmental protection. These questions have been central to many academic disciplines as well, though their answers have been similarly diverse. Our program focuses on five particular concepts or visions that illustrate the breadth of academ academic discourse on nature, spanning the physical and life sciences, behavioral and social sciences, humanities, and theology. Each vision offers a particular synthesis of biophysical and human nature and poses a challenge to commonly held assumptions about nature. The five are evolutionary nature, or nature is arising from evolutionary processes, which questions the commonly held notion of culture as being distinct from nature, and has often been understood, especially in the US, as a scientific challenge to religion. Emergent nature, or nature understood via complexity theory as an emergent reality, which has been invoked to provide an anti-reductionistic understanding of complex phenomena ranging from the universe to the mind to God. Third, malleable nature. Nature is subject to human alteration, which challenges the boundary between natural and artificial phenomena, raising ethical questions in the domains of science and religion alike. Nature is sacred, that is, nature is having significant spiritual qualities which challenges the distinction between matter and spirit and as such may be difficult to reconcile with scientific materialism and some religious theologies. And finally, nature as culture, that is, as a culturally based concept which stands evolutionary nature on its head by challenging ideas of nature as being distinct from culture and more broadly suggests that scientific and religious outlooks are, in many ways, cultural constructions. As you can surmise, some of these visions could perhaps be readily reconciled, but others clearly cannot. Their implications for science and religion are similarly diverse and somewhat contradictory. And all of these visions make some claim to comprehensiveness or universality that leaves little room for accommodation with other visions. So one of the challenges our program faces is in deciding how or indeed whether it is possible 
to come up with new, perhaps more synthetic visions that weave these diverse visions of nature together? And if so, what implications follow for science, religion, and their relationship? One answer to this challenge, reflected in the dodecahedron image here, is that each vision offers a particular perspective on nature, but it all depends on where you're standing, and thus there's no way to bring these perspectives together. Another answer, though, is that each vision is far more limited than its adherents believe that like the famous story of the blind men and the elephant suggested in this image, if, we all, if all we touch is the tail, we're tempted to believe the elephant is a rope. And if all we touch is the ear, the elephant becomes a fan. Clearly on this view, we must discard these limited visions of nature and craft new synthetic visions suggested in the elephant itself. As Michael will soon elaborate, in his own research, Hans is engaged with a wide range of scientists, historians, philosophers, and religious scholars, and has doubtless encountered a similarly wide range of understandings of biophysical and human nature. So what I will be interested in learning is whether Hans has yet found this elephant, or if he even believes it possible to formulate a synthetic, at least less fragmented, vision of nature, science, and religion. And with this background, I now welcome Michael Osborne, who will introduce our special guest and his talk. Thank you. Um, I, I've been warned by some of the participants in our group not to make lengthy introductions, and uh, so I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, Professor Hans Tyson of Radboud University at Nijmegen has a long history of tackling big questions and also in stirring up interest in big projects. For example, nearly 10 years ago, I think, uh, shortly after leaving postdoctoral appointments here at UCSB, where he was mentored by uh, Jeffrey Russell, who's sitting on my right, um, and before he went to that lesser known University of Harvard, um, he founded the extremely successful journal, Early Science and Medicine. Now this journal, uh, covers research in the history and philosophy of scientific and medical thought from antiquity all the way through the end of the 18th century. Now this span of time, uh, you may note, uh, mirrors, give or take a few decades for a historian, the intellectual run of Aristotle's thought, particularly his biological thought, elements of which survived into the 19th century. Now Aristotle and Dyson ask big questions. Aristotle, of course, told us how to study animals and about the properties of life, a really big question. Living things moved, he said. They reproduce. And by studying the organs of reproduction, we learn a lot about form and about function and about how form and function are intertwined, and we can learn something about purpose. As a philosopher and historian of ancient science uh, and medieval science, Professor Tyson has investigated Aristotle's theory of mind, Aristotle's assertion of the eternality of the earth. And also, he has authored a series of editions of a premier Aristotelian commentator, the 14th century medieval philosopher John Buridan. Buridan, who worked at the University of Paris, never bothered to take a terminal degree and therefore remained what historians call a secular cleric. Now, Professor Tyson, although he took a degree at what was then the Catholic University of Nijmegen and is now head of faculty at the same university now renamed for a rather obscure saint, also avoided the terminal degree in theology. This has not, though, prevented him from asking the big questions. In, act, in a matter of fact, he has asked some of the most <clears throat> um, broad questions about big events in the history of Western Christendom's engagement with science and Greek um, and, and theology. And many of the events, it happens, and personages that he brings to light just happen to be associated with the University of Paris. His book of 1998, Censor and Heresy at the University of Paris, examined a celebrated flashpoint 
in the engagement of philosophical rationalism um, on the one hand and theology on the other hand. This was, of course, the condemnation or condemnations of 1277 when the Bishop of Paris condemned the teaching of 219 philosophical and theological propositions. The largest of the big issues of existence that you can imagine, uh, and also of issues of the hereafter, were then in play. And for some, these were both dangerous and really fearful conjectures for more, mere mortals to undertake. Perhaps philosophy and science, or the science of the philosophers, had gone too far. What were the proper limits of philosophy and theology anyway? Should philosophers and students be allowed to investigate nature, be allowed to ponder God and whether God was knowable in any human way? What was the supreme power of God? What about Aristotle's claim that the earth had always been there, had never been created, it had just uh, been there? What about human free will? Finally, there was the disquieting idea that there might just be two truths. That is to say, one arrived at by science, another through revelation. And finally, that lingering question of whether theology itself just might be a science. Now, Professor Thyssen has promised he will not, I repeat, not deliver his lecture in either German or Latin or French or Dutch. Dutch, he assures me, is something the Dutch reserve for themselves so we can breathe this collective sigh of relief. Now, tonight, in honor of tackling those large and maybe imponderable questions, Professor Thyssen solicits our indulgence as he asks what it meant to be human in the pre-modern era in his lecture entitled between Apes and Angels, the Pre-Modern Place of Humans in the Hierarchy of Nature. Professor Tyson. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, your, your kind words and, uh, <clears throat> and the warm reception I have received uh, at uh, UCSB. Uh, I hope that will continue also after the lecture. Um, I, I, um, I had to bring some papers because I'm not really used anymore to teaching in English, uh, so I, I need to read uh, parts. And I, um, I hope I've practiced enough uh, on my accent and that you will be able to follow it. Um, and as a kind of support, I, uh, I use a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, as um, Michael uh, mentioned, uh, the talk will be about uh, human nature. And human nature, or the concept of human nature, is an elusive uh, concept. Um, we know uh, humans when we meet them, and yet um, when you are pressed to give a definition, uh, then it uh, gets far more difficult. Um, what exactly is the, most, the single most distinctive feature that marks us off from other species? In other words, what does it mean to be human? Before Darwin, this question was molded in the following form. What does distinguish humans from animals? What is the difference between man and beast? What we are looking for is some essential characteristic that differentiates all human beings from animals. Nowadays, we would think that everything is wrong with this question, unless you believe that men are machines or angels. Nowadays, you would ask what is um, um, how are we distinguished among animals? Before, after all, um, we are 98% uh, uh, chimpanzees in our genes. We are apes. And yet, at the same time, it's very unlikely that you will ever marry a great ape. So, what is the difference? What sets us off from uh, the other apes? What is unique about us? One of the most familiar answers to that question has been that uh, humans have the power of reason. But how do you spot reason? How do you detect that someone has reason? The problem of detecting the possession, possession of reason posed itself when the first encounters occurred, either in text or in real life, with the inhabitants of the new world, or with creatures such as apes or 
pygmies or dog heads or Bigfoot. Um, in what category do these creatures belong? Are they human? Are they subhuman? Are they non-human? What are the outward signs of the ability to reason? Did these creatures resemble us at all? Speech, tool making, and social life have been suggested as sure signs of rational behavior. Interestingly, this same checklist still plays a prominent role in contemporary debates about human nature. The psychologist Sue Savage Rumbaugh, for instance, she, she's a very famous uh, researcher into um, uh, chimpanzee languages. She um, uh, once claimed that in the case of ape language, quote, almost any interpretation of the data leads inevitably to a redefinition of man and the sciences that study man, end of quotation. Why do primatologists believe that doing research into chimpanzee linguistics will tell us something about human nature and not merely about chimpanzees? The answer lies, I think, in the past. The current debate about how much apes are like us reaffirms some of the old criteria for rationality, such as language, skills, and social behavior. The story of how these criteria came to be significant in the first place is a long one and has many twists. The concept of human nature is not something to be taken for granted. It is a product from the past. And that is the point I would like to bring home this evening. And as a point of departure for my lecture, I take uh, one particular episode which I will try to analyze. It's, it's a work which has been written or has been hailed as a landmark in the history of evolutionary theory. It's a work written by a certain um, Edward Tyson, who is no uh, relative, which you will see uh, when you see the spelling. Edward Tyson, um, um, yeah, let, let's, let's get to how he gets into the story. So late um, 1697, or maybe it was the beginning of 1698, a ship arrived in the, in the harbor of London carrying, among other things, a creature that had been captured in Angola. In the spring of 1698, Edward Tyson, England's most famous anatomist, was presented with the corpse of this little uh, traveler. And he dissected it. And you can still see him in, or it, or her, or him, no, it's a him, um, in the British Museum. Uh, during the voyage, the creature had stumbled into a cannon and had gotten a tooth infection and had died. So while aboard the ship, the creature had revealed itself as, quote, most gentle and loving. As Tyson later reported, quote, those that he knew, so he, he means the creature, those that he knew a ship aboard, he would come and embrace with the greatest tenderness, opening their bosoms and clasping his hands about them. And as I was informed, Though there were monkeys aboard, yet it was observed that he would never associate with them, and as if nothing akin to them, would always avoid their company." End of quotation. Tyson noted that from the head downward, the creature was quite hairy, and the hair was so thick that it covered the skin almost from being seen. Quote, Nature, therefore, has clothed it with hair, as a brute, to defend it from the injuries of the weather. And when it goes on all fours, as a quadruped, it seems all hairy. When it goes erect, as a biped, it appears before less hairy and more like a man." End of quote. After the creature had been captured, it was forced to getting used to clothes. Here is another quote from uh, Tyson. It was fond enough of them, and what it could not put on himself, it would bring in his hands to some of the company to help him to put on. It would lie in a bed, place his head on a pillow, and pull the clothes over him as a man would do, but was so careless and so very a brute as to do all nature's occasions there. 
It was very full of lies when it came under my hands, which maybe it got on shiverboard, for they were exactly like those on a humane body. In 1699, Tyson published his findings about a creature in a treatise, which he called Orangutan Sive Homo Silvestris, or the anatomy of a pygmy, compared with that of a monkey, an ape, and a man. Now, before I um, can move on to, um, to the uh, conceptual framework of this work, I, um, I need to say something about uh, the terminology which is used here. I mean, in the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, um, there was a very confusing uh, terminology. So Tyson, he was already convinced that the creature that had been presented to him was not, not a man, but a beast. However, one of the purposes of the book was precisely to demonstrate that this animal resembled a man in many of its parts, more than any of the ape kind or any other animal in the world. His book did much to establish the method of comparative anatomy and the study of primates, for the creature which Tyson had dissected actually had been a juvenile chimpanzee. But um, you couldn't tell it from, from the title. So what do they mean in, at the time Tyson was writing with orangutan, homo silvestris, monkey, ape, man, pygmy? Um, at the time Tyson was writing, very little was known in Europe about primates. And what was known was marred with confusion. So monkey and ape for Tyson were the same species. So there was not yet this distinction which we now have that we have the great apes, which are orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, uh, gibbon. For, say, for uh, Tyson, they, they were all the same. So the term ape was not yet reserved for the uh, primates. Um, orangutan, um, that's another matter. Orangutan is a Malaysian word, and it means uh, man of the wood or man of the forest. And um, the Latin, homo silvestris, is exactly the same term. So that's pretty clear. But what is unclear is what I mean by an orangutan. They do not mean um, what we nowadays mean by orangutan, namely a primate from Southeast Asia. Uh, they use the term orangutan to, to um, designate any uh, primate, both African and Asian. And uh, this term orangutan had been introduced into the literature by um, a Dutch guy called uh, Jacob Bonsius. Um, he wrote a work uh, which appeared uh, posthumously in the 17th century, and um, there he provided perhaps the first European description of a primate, of an orangutan. But it's very confusing because although he is speaking about an orangutan, um, at the same time, he reports that this creature was the offspring of, as he says, lustful women with uh, monkeys. And to add to the confusion, um, he gave this uh, drawing uh, of, of the creature. So this is the orangutan of Bonsius. Well, it's more like a hairy woman. Now, another illustration of, of an orangutan was produced by the Dutch physician Nicholas Tulp, uh, Tulip. Uh, maybe you know Tulp without, without knowing that you knew him, because he is a prominent figure in a, in a painting by Rembrandt. This is um, a painting, it's called The Anatomy Lesson, and the central figure, the guy with the hat on, he is Tulp. And the same guy uh, described and designed a, uh, what he calls an orangutan. And it was a creature that had been presented to the Prince of Orange. That was in the, let's say, the small zoo of the Prince of Orange, the menagerie. And um, there's also a story of this. Um, the Prince of Orange was once visited by, by a French cardinal. And apparently, uh, when the cardinal passed the cage of this creature, he allegedly said, um, speak to me and I will baptize you. So this is. Uh, the creature which uh, Tulp uh, saw. But if we look at this picture, we would say it's a chimpanzee, but uh, Tulp calls it the orangutan. So this gives you an idea of the terminological confusion 
at the time uh, Tyson was writing. As is clear from uh, references in his own work, Tyson was familiar with the literature about orangutans. Yet, he chose another name for the creature that had been presented to him. He preferred to call it a pygmy because he believed that this creature was described in the ancient literature about pygmies. But what is a pygmy? Um, obviously, uh, Tyson was not thinking of the people in equatorial Africa when he was writing his treatise. He means something else by it. By pygmies, he hogs back on to um, ancient literature where a, a people is described, which are called pygmies. There you have to go back to, to the Greek and the Latin because uh, pygmy is from the Latin word pygmaeus, which comes from the uh, uh, Greek pygmaeus. And that's nothing else but uh, a measure. It's, I think in English you, you would call it a cubit or something. It's, uh, it's, it's a measure from, from the elbow to the tip of your finger. So the, the only thing you're saying is that you are talking about people which are as tall as, 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 as your arm. There are pygmies. And um, this, these creatures were uh, described in, uh, in a very famous uh, work on natural history uh, written by uh, a, a person called Pliny. And also it's described in, in, uh, in Homer and in Aristotle. And uh, when, um, when Tyson saw the corpse, he thought, oh, this is a pygmy, because he, he thought he recognized uh, what he had read in the ancient literature. So after this, um, what I hope to have been a terminological clarification, let's move back to the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework, oh, this is uh, Tyson's pygmy. I, I forgot to show that. That's, um, yeah, it's, it's a chimpanzee. Of course, uh, there are a few odd uh, aspects in the drawing. I mean, usually uh, chimpanzees do not walk around with uh, walking sticks or as a biped. But that, that also goes back to an iconographical tradition, and we need not go into that. That's, here you see all four, uh, of these creatures uh, in, in, in a later uh, illustration. Hmm? Tulp, the pygmy of uh, Tyson sitting on a bench, and the Pilos woman uh, of Bontius. Conceptual framework. The conceptual framework is furnished by two authorities, St. Augustine and Aristotle. In a, a particular passage in the City of God, Augustine had raised the question whether the monstrous races described in pagan history had descended from Adam, the first human being. Quote, now we are not bound to believe in the existence of all the types of men which are described, but no faithful Christian should doubt that anyone who is born anywhere as a man, that is, as a rational and moral being, derives from that one first created being, Adam. And this is true, however extraordinary such a creature may appear to our senses, in bodily shape, in color, or motion, or utterance, or in any natural endowment, or part, or quality, and of quotation. So what Saint Augustine is saying here is that even races such as pygmies or dog heads or other unusual or monstrous races could be human. Um, the physical appearance does not give you a clue about what it is. By the same token, races that did resemble human beings in physical appearance need not be human at all. This is the con conclusion that Tyson draws from his anatomical comparison between man and pygmy. The body he was dissecting was more like a man in its anatomical structure than any other species of animal. According to Tyson's counting, there were 48 anatomical features in which it resembled human beings against 34 which, approximate, which approximated that of the ape and monkey kind. Yet, 
Tyson did not conclude that his pygmy was therefore a human being and not a beast. On the contrary, Tyson's discovery of the pygmy's human-like anatomy made him reject the ancient stories that pygmies were human beings. The ancient authors had been misled, according to Tyson. The physical shape and form just is not conclusive in determining the nature of a pygmy. According to Tyson, the similarity in organs and even in the brain does not correspond to what he calls a similarity in actions. For if only the anatomy were relevant, not only would pygmies be elevated to the level of humans, but humans would be downgraded to, quote, to mere brutes and matter. Whereas in truth, man is part a brute, part an angel, and is that link in creation that joins them both together. So in other words, if you would merely draw conclusions from the physical appearance, then you can say, okay, it looks like a man, so it's probably a man, but by the same token, you could say of human beings that they are, must be beasts because they resemble beasts. Tyson concludes that the animal of which I have given anatomy coming nearest to mankind seems the nexus of the animal and rational. So what is the decisive factor if not the anatomy? Why was the pygmy not human? But some kind of intermediate link in the chain of creation? The answer that Tyson gives to that question rests in the work of Aristotle. From Aristotle, Tyson and many others borrowed and expanded the concept of what came to be known as the chain of being, or the scale of nature. According to this concept, the universe is filled with distinct species, which are ordered according to a continuous gradation. Throughout his work, Tyson proves himself to be an ardent proponent of the chain of being. In the preface, he states, quote, that from minerals to plants, from plants to animals, and from animals to man, the th transition is so gradual that there appears a very great similitude as well between the meanest plant and some minerals as between the lowest rank of man and the highest kind of animals. The animal of which I have given the anatomy coming nearest to mankind. Now, which factor determines the order in the continuum of nature? According to Aristotle, the hierarchical order of nature is determined by the power of soul. This view deserves some further explanation. According to Aristotle, whatever is alive has a soul. The Greek word here is, um, which you can still find back in English also, is uh, psyche, and in Latin anima, psyche, so in the psyche. But what is psyche, or how do you notice that something is alive? How do you detect that something is alive? Because it displays certain capacities, according to Aristotle. But not all living organisms display the same capacities. Some, such as plants, have the capacity to use food and to reproduce. Others, such as animals, also have the capacity for self-movement or sensation and desire. But there is only one kind of living things that also possesses the power of thinking and thought. In sum, humans share certain features which other living, with other living organisms, such as growth and reproduction, but they are unique in that they possess reason. The capacity to think and to reason is linked to their psyche, to the specific principle of life that is inherent, inherent in uh, human beings. Reason is the uh, distinctive feature of humans and this feature also uh, plays an important role in Aristotle's ethics. I I'm here giving uh, briefly the, uh, the, the names of the treatises of Aristotle. So in the history of animals he uh, presents this idea that the entire creation goes uh, upward in, in, in a scale of gradation 
and in the treatise which is called On the Soul, he, he explains what it means to be uh, alive, what, how you can detect that something is alive, and in what sense uh, plants, uh, bees, and humans uh, differ. So it's reason. Now, what, does it, what role does it play in, in the ethics? According to Aristotle, humans have an understanding of what matters in life. They can plan their own lives. There are many wrong plans to conduct your life, but there is only one right plan to achieve a good life. The right plan is the plan that aims at the right goal, according to Aristotle. A goal that is shared by all human beings. According to Aristotle, that goal is happiness or success. And uh, bo both are, uh, well, common English translations of the Greek term eudaimonia. You, it's either translated as happiness or success. Well, what, what is happiness? What is the happiness that everyone seeks? Um, and yet no one can really give a reason why he wants it. If, if you ask someone, do you want to be happy? You say, yes, of course. But why? Yeah. I don't want to be unhappy, I want to be happy. Whereas if you ask someone, do you want to be rich? And they say yes, and then you ask why, and say okay, then I can buy a nice car, or I can take care of my parents, or I can do this and that. Or I want to be healthy because then I can finish my book. Or, But if you ask, um, do you want to be successful? Why? Yeah, because. And Aristotle calls this a sake, um, an end for its own sake. Uh, happiness is an ultimate goal. You, you cannot ask any further um, if you ask uh, why. Hmm? It has to stop there. And why is that? Aristotle thinks that happiness is the same for us all. And th that might be strange if you, if you hear that for the first time. You think, well, but what makes me happy, for instance, uh, a fast car, and someone else is happy if he has continuous access to email or uh, <laughs> to, uh, I don't know, you, you think it, it, it should be different for people. But um, the other day I, I was in a bookstore and I, I saw this book on how to please your husband. So what does it mean if you have a book which says how to please your husband? And this, this is picked up by, by every woman, I suppose. So apparently there is a category husbands and there is one standard recipe uh, to, uh, to please husbands. And in, in the same way, Aristotle thinks that there is one standard recipe to make all human beings happy. And um, this belief that, that rests on a certain assumption that um, the ultimate purpose of humans is linked to what Aristotle calls to their function. Um, so, yeah, what does it mean that humans have a function? I mean, you, you can say a knife has a function. For instance, uh, the function of a knife is that it cuts. What is the function of a human being? Well, here comes the answer. The function of a human being is, it's not life. It's because, quote, life seems to be common even to plants. But we are seeking what is peculiar to man. Let us exclude, therefore, the life of nutrition and growth. Next, there would be a life of perception, but it also seems to be common, even to the horse, the ox, and every animal. There remains, then, an active life of the element that has a rational principle. So, in other words, only functions that are distinctively human determine human excellence, and these are functions associated with reason. For Aristotle, living well means living one's life under the guidance of reason. Um, there is a third di dimension to this idea that, that reason defines uh, humanity, and that is a social or what you can call a political aspect. Um, let's see. So Aristotle thinks that um, the pursuit of happiness, which is uh, the goal of every human being, that it can be best reach, reached um, in a community, in what he calls a polis, a, a city-state, 
and in city state, then you have to think not about uh, the state of California or anything, but more like uh, a community like uh, Santa Barbara. So you can be happy on your own, but you would be even more happier if you would be living together with other human beings. Virtuous activity in accordance with reason leads to human flourishing, particularly so in a state. So the state, in Aristotle's view, is a communal enterprise which has as its common task the happiness of man. Now, in the context of this social theory, Aristotle develops the idea that animals and natural slaves are unfitted by nature to form a state, since they do not have the power of reason. So there again returns this uh, theme of reason. What are natural slaves? Quote, the natural slave is one who is capable of belonging to another, which is why he does so belong, and who shares reason to the extent of appreciating it, but not having it. The other animals do not obey reason by appreciating it, but obey only their passions. So in some natural slaves can listen to reason, they can understand reason, but they cannot reason by themselves. They need someone to govern them. So what does that, this have to do with the uh, debate about human nature? Well, for instance, in the 1550s, there occurred a huge debate in uh, uh, Spain between uh, Bartolomé de las Casas and Juan Quines de Sepulveda about uh, the question whether the inhabitants of the New World, whether they were humans or whether they were natural slaves. And uh, Sepulveda argued that they were slaves and for this reason you could uh, wage a just war against them. Quote, in prudence, talent, virtue, and humanity, they, and he means an, uh, natives from uh, South America, are as inferior to the Spaniards as children to adults, women to men, as the wild and cruel to the most meek, as the prodigiously intemperate to the continent and temperate, and, that I've almost said, as monkeys to men, and of quotation. So, here is a debate about uh, yeah, what, are, what are these new races which have been discovered or you should say rediscovered? Are they humans? Are they monkeys? Are they? And um, how should you treat them? The Las Casas, on the other hand, re refuted this idea. And he says they are not rational or natural slaves or unfit for government. And these are three, uh, yeah, the same qualifications. So he prepares a long treatise to defend um, the Indians, and he argues, among other things, that Indians are not irrational, but clever, that they are adept in grammar, in logic, that they are skilled in every mechanical art, that they have kingdoms, jurisdiction, and lawful government. In brief, they are capable of religion. Actually, he says, I do not know whether there is any other people readier to receive the gospel. Now, what is interesting here is that the capacity to form communities is highlighted as an important feature of human nature and it is linked to reason. So you can only understand this argumentation about natural slaves and about um, um, the ability to form a community if you um, have um, Aristotle at the back of your mind. And the same, same debates uh, return again in, in contemporary uh, discussions about primates where they also say, well, primates, communities of primates, uh, they, they um, show uh, social relations. Why, why would it be important that they have that? Well, maybe they have reason. Okay, let me return to um, the summing up. So Augustine's view that physical appearance is not very relevant in determining human nature, and Aristotle's idea that the possession of the faculty of reason is crucial, were taken up by Tyson. His pygmy stood at a higher level than either monkeys or apes, and in fact resembled man. Quote, but at the same time I take him to be wholly a brute, though in the formation of the body and in the sensitive or brutal soul it may be more resembling a man than any other animal, so that in this chain of the creation, as an intermediate link between an ape and a man, 
I would place our pygmy. So Tyson places him uh, under the great divide, uh, so under uh, two, um, so in the realm of, of the animals, but uh, high up, the highest in the rank. In this way, Tyson revived a claim that had first been made in the Middle Ages by the theologian Albert the Great in one of his works. Albert discusses whether pygmies should be included in the human family. In his view, all soul-endowed beings are ordered according to their degree of perfection. The powers of the soul provide the criteria for the hierarchical arrangement. Some animals, such as apes and pygmies, have developed their powers of the soul to such a degree that they can imitate human skills. But they will never master any skills. Hence, Albert claims that pygmies lack real reason and only possess what he calls a shadow of reason. They are not human, but resemblances, resemblances of humankind because their mental functions somehow resemble the human intellect. Their position in the chain of being is determined by their degree of perfection. And the degree of perfection can be measured and compared with the help of the notion of uh, disciplinability. I don't even know where it's an English word, but uh, this is how I uh, translated the Latin. Disciplinability. Well, it, it is easier than it may sound. Uh, what, um, um, what Albert means by disciplinability is um, the ability to learn something. And um, Albert had noticed that it is easier to, to teach tricks to a dog than, say, to, to a fly or to a, to a goldfish. So um, in the degree of perfection, uh, the dog is higher than the goldfish. Um, even more higher is the pygmy. He is actually the highest uh, of the animals. He is at the midpoint between humans and animals but still located in the realm of animals. So here you see the same uh, uh, scheme as in uh, Tyson, that the pygmy is placed um, as the highest of the animals. Again, according to this chain of being, this degrees of perfection, and uh, well, this time um, the ability to learn something is taken as, as, as the criterion. Albert's conclusion is that pygmies are a midpoint between humans and animals, but still located in the realm of animals. They are just below humans, but within the category of beasts, not in some intermediate category. Albert points out that the pygmies' position in the scale of nature, just after human beings, is also reflected in their behavior. Pygmies do not care for citizenship and laws. As again, this uh, argument, th this, um, argument from Aristotle's politics, but rather follow their natural instincts. Moreover, they cannot distinguish between what is shameful and what is honorable. They can speak, but only about very concrete things. They cannot carry on a discussion. Tyson knew Albert's discussion of pygmies, but he only mentioned it in passing. He observes that Albert correctly guessed that pygmies were a sort of apes but that he spoiled everything by making them speak. He maintained that Albert presented his views in such an unsophisticated fashion, quote, that it is as difficult almost to understand his language as his apes. If the reader has a mind to attempt it, he will find it in the margin. And then you see a brief footnote. And I'm not sure whether Tyson really uh, read the entire uh, uh, rather long uh, treatment uh, that Albert gives about pygmies. So, conclusion. What now is the upshot of Tyson's discussion? In my lecture, I have offered a broad sketch of some of the important issues relating to the debate about human nature. Tyson's anatomical project was embedded in a conceptual framework that harks back to Aristotle. Understanding what it means to be human was approached from one angle, namely the ability to reason. The idea that the power of thinking is the best human quality is an idea that was associated with views about man's purpose to lead a good life. The particular nature of humans determines what course of life they have to take. In Aristotle's view, 
Human nature was a beacon to be followed. Humans had to live up to their nature and in this way cherish the share of the divine in them. That's what he also says in the ethics. The reason is, is a share of the divine in us. Um, and what's also interesting to know is that um, Aristotle's idea that humans are distinguished by reason was controversial. There were also ancient uh, thinkers who claimed that animals had reason and that animals could speak. The ethical context has disappeared in Tyson's treatise, but its focus on reason stems from Aristotle. The excursion into the past also makes us aware that attempts to define humankind in cultural terms basically derive from the same source. Human is as human does, and what human does is ingrained in his nature. Communication through language, social behavior, and skills are capacities that indicate the presence of reason. In this sense, Tyson's anatomy not only shows the direct impact of an Aristotelian tradition, but can also, in a larger perspective, be seen as its continuation up until the present. Even though the discussion is now framed in evolutionary terms, many of its assumptions are still those of Aristotle. Thank you.